Fox all. Thank you. Thank you for this deep honor. But before I begin, a caveat. I love to make speeches. I love being on stage. Most people have deep phobias about public speaking, not me. I love it. But I only love it when someone else has written the speech for me. Especially and preferably when the author is William Shakespeare, Eugene O'Neill, or Arthur Miller. And when you are all sitting in the dark, and your cell phones are off, and the lights are perfectly focused, and when I have a really great costume to wear. Okay, I have the great costume. But I became an actor to prolong a child's imagination and live in imaginary circumstances. This is real up here, y'all. <clears throat> and I'm shaking up here in this fancy nightgown. So be kind with your reviews, please. Thank you also on behalf of my dad, who is here in attendance today. You are fulfilling a long-standing dream of his for his son to perform on the stage of the Muni Opera. <laughs> Commencement speech is a performance per se, but still, not a bad gig for a kid from South St. Louis. Holly Hills Boulevard, between Morgan Ford and Gravois to be exact. St. Stephen Protomartyr, class of 81. Bishop DeBroat High School, class of 85. Webster University, class of 1990. For a young actor with limited resources and a ball and chain of a name, I never in my wildest dreams could have predicted I would end up center stage here, in my hometown, in front of so many dear friends, family, and former teachers giving a commencement speech and receiving this deep distinguished honor. I am grateful. Thank you. Now about that name, let's just address the elephant at the podium, shall we? <laughs> Norbert Leo Butts. It's not that bad, right? I mean, sure, it doesn't roll trippingly off the tongue, but a sonically pleasing name never seemed to me a prerequisite for being a successful actor. In a world where we have celebrated actors with names like Mariska Hargitay, Benedict Cumberbatch, Shia LaBeouf, and even fellow St. Louisan and far wealthier television star John Hamm. John Hamm, that's his name. Good thing I never married that dude's sister, I'd be married to a ham butts. While a student at Webster University, and this is a true story, I had a teacher who spent the better part of a private conference offering suggestions for stage names. If I recall, Bert Lee was her rave fave. I think her exact words were to me, Norbert Butts, you will never work with that name. <laughs> now, if you know my dad, who also shares my name, you know his deep German pride, his former Marine's metabolism, his naturally rebellious heart, then you also know that the apple doth protest too much and people in glass houses should never say never to a guy named Norbert Butts. I'm not a naturally competitive person, but the words you will never are like Red Bull for my soul. Not only will I not change my name, but I will succeed. And I will work. And I will continue to get the crap beaten out of me and be ridiculed every time my name is seen in print or spoken on TV. So there! I stubbornly refuse to touch my God-given name, choosing instead cultural and familial authenticity. And what I learned on that day is this. For all that is holy, if you have been born with a name so bad that it prompts a tenured professor to use valuable FaceTime urging you to change it, do it! Immediately! Your stupid pride will only bring you a lifetime of bullying. 
If you think the snickers and jeers will stop when you are quasi-famous and receiving honorary doctorates, oh, you are wrong. I swear I saw some of these fancy peeps up here hiding behind smirks when they announced my name. It will never end. <laughs> Seriously, I'm deeply honored to be here today. My time at Webster forever changed me, and changed me for the better, I think. I learned what art was at Webster. I learned how history impacts art, and vice versa. I began to think about thinking, about how I could take my obsession for acting and broaden its range. In the conservatory, I became restless and curious. I became, God help me, ambitious. <laughs> My first acting teacher at Webster was the late, great Michael Pierce, a brilliant acting teacher who demanded we go about the business of studying acting with the precision and commitment of medical students. Two of my finest teachers are here in attendance today. I was lucky enough to get one semester with the wonderful Kat Singleton. In her inaugural year at Webster, Kat demanded we be fearless in our emotional lives. She wanted us to take risks in her scene study class, and risk we did. I put a hole in a wall during a rehearsal of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, if I remember correctly. Tennessee Williams, St. Louis boy he was, always gets my blood going. <clears throat> That hole was one of my prouder moments, a little gift I left for the university. Bruce Longworth ignited me with a lifelong passion for Shakespeare. His class was one of constant discovery of the raw power of language and human sound. We loved him. The late Rita Madsen taught a Shakespeare course through the Lit Lang department so legendary, students would beg, borrow, or steal to get into that class. The late sister Deborah Pearson taught a course on major dramatists that is still the best history class I have ever had. Great teachers, all of them. Their instruction is the foundation of any success that I have had in this business we call show. One of my greatest memories of my time at the conservatory at Webster was a production of a play about the AIDS crisis in 1987 called The Normal Heart by Larry Kramer. The play is really um, a scream of grief by the playwright to evoke social and political change in response to the apathy and the outright homophobia of much of Washington and society at large in the early years of the HIV AIDS crisis. We were just a Mid Midwest college production over there in stage three. But ours was the first Midwest production of that play. And our director, the brilliant and fearless Marita Woodruff, galvanized our minds and gave us the conviction of activists. There were many projects like The Normal Heart where we as students felt like ambassadors for change like we were performing a service for the campus and the community at large. Naive, perhaps, that line of thinking, but also life-changing. I have steadfastly refused to adopt reductive attitudes toward acting or any of the performing arts. I am not merely an entertainer, sorry, Hollywood, <coughs> or the talent, as we are referred to on film and television sets. Theater and music, and yes, big, splashy Broadway musicals, are not excursions merely, or escapist fun, or theme park rides. Although they can be all of those things, and there's nothing wrong with that. But, they can also matter to the culture, to the society, to the education of young people. Theater, music, and dance can and do contribute, essentially, to the dialogue on politics, religion, sex, ethics, art, and science. This is what I was taught at Webster. This is what I hold to be true. Art can transform, enlighten, perhaps even heal a community, an individual, a soul. 
This belief, this conviction of mine has been tested mightily in the last few years. I lost my sister, Teresa, three years ago in a senseless act of sexual violence. When a man... Resistance and bravery by my little sister. But Teresa succumbed to her wounds and died on her front lawn, naked, at three in the morning, in the arms of the daughter of her next door neighbor, a young woman of 17. The courage of my sister, the courage of that girl, my mind cannot comprehend. This loss, this grief has shaken my family to its core. The questions, the trial, the lingering pain uh, will never leave me. It walks with me everywhere. But a terrible beauty has come from this man's hideous and cowardly act. And we are healing as the human spirit must. Two of my sister's oldest and dearest childhood friends, Rachel Ebling and Jean Fox Robertson, started a not-for-profit in my sister's honor called the Angel Band Project after attending her funeral. Now, a little background information. I am from a family of music lovers. My sister was a rabid music fan, and several of my siblings loved to sing, play guitar, piano. I'm one of 11 kids. Uh, and with my youngest sister graduating this morning from nursing school with her degree in Pittsburgh, all 11 college graduates, thanks mom and dad, they're here today. A round of applause for my <laughs> Music was just something that we all did. Mom and dad always had an upright piano in the living room. My oldest brother Steve discovered the guitar as a kid. My brother Mike excelled at piano and accordion. And this love for music just sort of trickled down. We all sang in choir, church, high school musicals. So Jean and Rachel asked us to record some of the music we sang on the day of her funeral and other songs my sister loved. Many were songs of faith, as my parents are believers, and instilled in each of us kids the power of faith, of a Holy Spirit that offered a life that could be lived beyond death. With donated funds, we made a grassroots CD. They started a website. They got educated on the issues of sexual violence. We performed concerts to raise money and awareness. They shared information. They attended conferences. We read books, built knowledge, and wept. And wept, and wept, and wept. And we're healing. And now, like the student actor activists we learned to be at Webster U, we are trying to provide a service with the Angel Band Project, a service for survivors of sexual violence through music therapy. By listening to music, writing songs, and lyrics, playing and singing, the project is seeking to bring the taboo subject of sexual violence into the light. In the aftermath of trauma, The project wishes to put the focus back onto the healing and validation of the victims of sexual violence as opposed to the criminals, their histories, their motivations. And we still live in a culture that keeps these issues taboo in the shadows. Social scientists, women rights activists have told us over and over again that a woman is victimized twice, once by her perpetrator, once again by the legal system. When a Wisconsin state representative was quoted as saying, some girls rape easy, it is hardly a wonder that we still live in a culture that shames the victims of sexual violence rather than the criminals. Violence against women is the issue to be eradicated in the 21st century. State authors Nicholas Kristof and Cheryl Wadoon of the groundbreaking book, Half the Sky. The issue is so large, so complex, it's not difficult to understand why it's still so taboo. The statistics are still overwhelming. One is apt to freeze or shove one's shoulders in a gesture of, what can I do? And I say to you, Webster graduates of 2013, 
plenty. And I can start with this simple idea. When watching your favorite television show, or building a queue on Netflix, or heading to the AMC Multiplex, or downloading games or films or web series, or even just channel surfing at 2 a.m. from your sofa, say no to violence against women in so-called entertainment. Change the channel at the very least. Write the producers, the writers, the creatives of violent, exploitive in, in imagery and let them know it's not allowed in your home. I have also done some work in t uh, TV and films and just last year I finally took a stand with my agents and manager. I will not audition for material that uses the rape, mutilation, or murder of a woman for the purpose of adding suspense to a plot to tease or titillate an audience when a narrative gets boring. Guess what? I had to turn down almost all the scripts I received. Because the fact remains, women worldwide are still thought to be the inferiors of men. And their bodies, especially the bodies of the young and the poor, are believed to be made for the sole purpose of enhancing the power or the pleasure or a twisted combination of the two of men. This deep-seated oppression must end. We all know it must end. And you, as college graduates, literally know better. Your degrees are proof that you have been taught to know better. To recognize oppression and call it what it is. To treat all humans with dignity and respect. To empower your fellow man and your fellow woman. I have three daughters as well two of whom are teenagers, both of whom who have, uh, have had to deal with unwanted sexual innuendos from boys in the halls of their public middle and high schools, both of whom who have been groped or grabbed in their public school cafeterias. I cannot afford to be ambivalent about the issue of sexual violence. When one in four women will be the victim of an unwanted sexual assault on a college campus, and I have three daughters, I'm guessing I'm a, I'm a lucky man not to have had one more. If I had one more, I suppose, I'd really be sad. I don't sleep well with that math. These are my girls, my babies. This is what they will deal with as women in the culture. What are you gonna do about it, Dad? That's a question for all dads and future dads out there. And moms. And boyfriends and husbands. What are you going to do? How are you going to treat the women in your lives? How are you going to help end the culture of violence against women on television, in music, in homes and public parks and back seats of cars all over America, in brothels in India and Cambodia, in villages in Africa, in dorm rooms and Greek houses and libraries at our best colleges and universities? If nothing else, it's a question well worth your time. And to the women out there, those of you who are survivors, but silent, those of you who have become discouraged with the system that routinely practices an inequitable distribution of justice, freeing rapists for political reasons, or because monetary privilege allows them to buy the law, and victimizing women a second time, making them relive deep humiliations and traumas in courtrooms to satisfy defenders or judges or juries. You're not alone. The Angel Band Project shares your grief. We share your fear. But we also offer validation, hope. We think music is a great place to start the healing. May your journeys be walked with conviction and courage and resilience, class of 13. Treat your fellow humans with the decency and respect you have been taught at Webster. Be good to yourselves, but never at the expense of someone else's dignity. Start there, and you will have taken the one crucial step against the stand on violence. 
God bless Webster. God bless you all. Congratulations and thank you.